Sorry about that, everybody. I was muted and my and my camera was off. How's everybody doing this evening? Welcome back. If this is your first live today, welcome to the channel. Welcome into today's live, tonight's live. But if this isn't, if this is your second, third, fourth, welcome on back. We've been doing a ton of lives today. My lordy, have we been busy? But we're almost, we're almost there. We've almost got through some uh, half of maybe the case updates that we have to go through. But if you're new to the channel, I'm Tanya. We do talk true crime here daily. So if that's something that you're into, smash the you know subscribe button, hit the like, all those fun things that we ask you guys to do. Um, if you hit the like, it really does help get the channel out there, brings more people into the chat and makes it more fun and entertaining to watch. I feel like whenever I'm in a chat, I like to see the chat flowing and reading what's going on. So if that's something that you're into too, don't forget to, you know, do all that fun stuff. Subscribe, come into the chat with us. So um, we haven't went over Idaho four in a little while. So I figured we would go back because today I saw that Nancy was putting out, she put out a podcast. She does podcasts and then she does, you know, videos. So I saw that she was doing that and I thought, let's go back. Let's go back and do some Idaho because hmm, we've been dealing with the kids lately. If you guys haven't heard, um, Riley Strand, I'm sure everyone's heard by now. He was found today. His um, family did come out and speak. We did do a, a press conference. We've done three today over that case. So if you need any anything, if you need to know anything, it's out there if you want to look at it. Hey, DM. Oh, look at that. You're upsetting about Riley. I know. Ladybug. Hey, Teresa. I know me too. It was. It's really sad. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Mary Beth. I sent out your package. I got it all, all boxed up this morning and I sent it. I took it to the post office myself. Hey, Otto. Welcome in, everybody. Hey, Aries. Got Aries Auto. Okay, that's good. Got them counted for. <laughs> I wish the chat was on this side for, so I could like be looking at the camera. Hey, Margo. If I miss anybody, sorry. I'm kind of flowing through them. Um, Cast Life's here. Ashley's here. <laughs> Made it. Hey, Elbeam. Hey, Eva. Welcome in, everybody. Welcome on in. West Virginia Holly Girls here. We're all here. Well, we're not all here, but they'll be flowing in, you know. Hey, Wizard Walt. <laughs> Welcome in, everybody. Hey, Lenora. I saw that you missed the live earlier. You're like, oh, I have to go back and watch. <laughs> He's here. back, Amber. So um, we are going to cover, like I said, Idaho tonight. So like I said, Nancy came out with a new video. She's actually right there staring at me, her cardboard cut out. So I'll put her behind me here shortly. She's kind of freaking me out over there. But before we get into that, I've got, there's just stuff. There's just stuff to go over in this case. You know me, I'll find something. Let me get my glasses clean. You know me, I'll find something to talk about. And I found it. Hey, Ryan, welcome on in. I'm going to put my glasses on. I think they need like adjusted or something. They're a little wide, but as long as they don't fall off my face, we're cool. I am going to put the link for the channel membership in the chat. If you guys would like to join our awesome, awesome channel, we'd love to have you. This is a great channel and I'm not trying to be biased, but I'm a little biased. Okay. So Ann Taylor, she's been out doing the most today, like lately, um, ever since, well, I don't know when, I don't know when this one that she did, but starting in February, she's actually been doing this ever since I think January 5th, 6th, when Brian Koberger got her, um, Retained as his attorney. So the last time we talked about this case, it was um, we were doing the Looking Back series with Nancy Grace. And so we haven't really covered anything other than that. And then we covered the hearing February 28th. Nothing's really come out. So like I said, Ann Taylor's been busy. She's been out doing the mostest, like the most. So tonight I'm going to take you around the streets of Idaho, mainly Latah County, Kootenanny County too. And we're going to check out where Anne's been because Anne's been doing some stuff. She's been, she's been trying. <laughs> hey, Harlow. Welcome in there, Harlow. <laughs> yeah, she's been, she's trying. She's trying. So first thing I want to show you, beautiful legal document, you know, I'm not going to show, I'm not going to go through all the documents tonight with y'all because uh, they be, they're boring. There's nothing to them. There's nothing even interesting at all. They're filing exhibits. Thank you. Seal exhibit. Thank you. But this one is extremely, <laughs> extremely interesting. So the Supreme Court came back with a ruling. Um, they're not even going to take a look at it. <laughs> like they don't even want her to come 
and like present her case. They don't even want to hear it. They don't want to see it on paper. They're cool. They're like, we're cool. We don't, <laughs> like, we, we don't want nothing to do with you. Like, Hey, for real, hey, Linda. Um, yeah, like we don't want nothing to do with you. So I'm like, okay, okay. That's what they're, that's where they're going. So this is just the, um, the rolling here and I put it in purple. We normally, um, do like color cord and I color like code them for you, but we didn't really have one for the Supreme court. So it's now purple. I think that we usually actually do the judges or no, we did one for, for a Delphi case. Now I can't remember. I have to look. But it just says order denying motion. And this is the only document I'll read and I'll make it everything else more exciting. Um, I promise. But order denying motion for permission, for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders. A motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders and motion to seal defendants motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders were filed by counsel for defendant on February 8th, 2024. An objection to motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders and motion to seal plaintiff's objection to motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders. That's not, oh, this is all boring. I know we're filed by counsel um, for plaintiff on February 20th, 2024. Therefore, after due consideration, it is ordered that defendants motion to seal defendants motion. I'm going to say it all again for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders and plaintiff's motion to seal motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders are granted. It is further ordered that defendants motion for permission to appeal from interlocutory orders is denied. So they're going to seal everything, seal, seal sign, seal, delivered. Ain't going to give it to nobody, but um, it's denied. So yeah, Catherine. Well, so I thought, okay, so I pictured this is weird, but I did. I pictured Brian Koberger kind of like just sitting on his like his jail floor, you know, with like all these papers around him. Cause we've read through the documents. We've read every single document in this case. That's why I'm just going to stream through these other ones for you tonight. Um, like not even going to read them all. Cause we went through them all. We went through so many. Um, so I always pictured him there with like all of his paperwork, you know, just going through it, highlighting or whatever. He has probably a pencil cause they don't really give you pens there. So pencil in it in. Um, but I heard that he has it all on a jump drive. It's all on like a flash drive. So he goes to the computer, like each day he gets like an hour out of a cell or whatever. And he can go over to the computer and look up his files. I guess he could probably do it more than that if he wants. Isn't that crazy? Don't even give you papers no more. They just give you, wonder if you lose your thumb drive, they give you another one. Do you have to pay for it? That's weird. I don't know. You know, like if you break something in school, you gotta buy it. Sealed, of course. Yeah. Sealed side. Yeah. Yeah. We won't see nothing, but they're pretty much saying they don't even want to take a look at it. I was, um, I was like listening to something earlier about it and I was like, Oh, that sounds bad. Nancy may even bring it up. Um, in her episode tonight that she did. So this is pretty much just like what I read over. Um, Brian Kohlberger's attorney appeal of grand jury indictment denied by Idaho Supreme court. And wait till I tell you what, I mean, one of these things that Ann did, it doesn't even have to do with Brian Koberger. <laughs> um, but I think it's going to fire you guys up even more than any of this. So a pretrial appeal filed with the Idaho Supreme Court by Brian Koberger's public defenders was denied Tuesday. The reasoning behind the denial was not provided. Kohlberger's attorneys claim prosecutors indicted their client improperly on four counts of first degree murder and a single count of burglary to the grand jury. Kohlberger's defense argued that grand jurors find the higher legal standard of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt instead of the widely accepted standard of probable cause in order to indict him. They only need to do beyond a reasonable doubt when they're in the courtroom, like in the actual trial. Judge John Judge told them they were wrong in an October hearing and put it in writing in December. Kohlberger's defense team then appealed that to the Idaho Supreme Court, which rejected their request, and the matter was closed. Like... Ain't looking good, Ann. Ain't looking good. So we're going to say, and zero, prosecution one. <laughs> or state will say one. Maybe I should make a board. I feel like I should. I feel like I need a whiteboard. Everyone else has a whiteboard. Where's my chalkboard or something? I need something like way not as cool as a whiteboard. Something like, you know, that would just get on your guys' nerves, like a corkboard or something. Put notes to it. 
Oh, Mary Beth, I hear you there with the allergies. Um, so they denied that. Now, what I'm going to read for you to you guys next, it put a fire up me like no other today. <laughs> when I read this right before the like right before the live, um, it was probably 30 minutes before I read this. Um, so if you liked anything about Ann Taylor, anything at all, I'm going to change your mind. She's working overtime. Brian Kohlberger, lawyer, makes death penalty intervention. She's going to the state. She's taking it to the state. Not for Brian, though. For all of the P's out there. P-E-D-O. She don't want them to be able to get the death penalty anymore in Idaho. Okay, well, I'll read through this. The lawyer representing Brian Kohlberger, who stands accused of murdering four University of Idaho students in 2022, is trying to limit which criminals qualify for the death penalty. Ann Taylor, chief of the Kootenanny County Public Defender's Office, argue, or urged, sorry, urged Idaho lawmakers not to pass a bill that would expand which defendants are eligible for capital punishment. The bill is seeking to make sexual crimes committed against children under the age of 12 punishable by death. Taylor has said the state would struggle to process an increase in capital punishment cases. So she's pretty much citing with those guys. She's, um, I mean, she's allowed to do what she wants. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going, I mean, I'm not Ann Taylor. I'm not the $200 an hour that she's making off of Brian Kohlberger's um, guilt or innocence. But what I am is a person that does true crime and I deal with a lot of kids' cases. Should we send her a flyer of um, Audrey Cunningham? Say this is what happens when they're out? Oh, she knows Yvonne. Oh, she knows he's guilty. She knows. I think, I said this before, like as a, as a lawyer, as an attorney, if you guys were an attorney and you had a DP case on the table or even just any case, any, any case. Okay. Let's say, um, and they're in jail. There's any case, especially like a murder. Would you ask them if they were guilty or would you just not want to know? Because the first word out of my mouth would be first words would be, are you guilty? And just give me the truth. You know what I mean? Like, cause I can work with it each way, but you know, like, because you can make up stuff for, you know, an offense, a defense if they're guilty. If you know they're guilty, you could probably make it a little bit better for them. I would ask, though. I would definitely ask. I would say, are you guilty? Are you innocent? Let's, I mean, tell me. I have to agree to like her. I'd ask for sure, Wizard World. So I think I would, too. I would, see, I would just want to know. I would be curious. I would just be curious to know. Just curious to know. But thank you guys all for being here. Don't, um, don't forget to hit that like button for me. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so she's she's doing the most. This just um, explains, you know, the the um, the case, which I think we all know. Brian Kohlberger is, you know, he stands accused of unaliving four University of Col um, four University of um, Idaho students, college students, um, November thirteenth, twenty twenty two. Maddie Mogan, Kayla Gonzalez, Xander Carnotal, Ethan Chapin, all age twenty twenty one, and their off campus house on one one two two King Road. I think I got up most of it. Brian Koberger um, was arrested at the end of December. Happy New Year to him. And he was flown, extradited from Pennsylvania, where his parents live, mommy and daddy live, to Idaho. And we all watched it like Santa. Literally. I want to watch that again, kind of. He literally flew like Santa, and we watched it on a radar tracker. <laughs> I mean, this is this is a big case. This is a, I mean, if you know it's big, if we're watching it on a flight tracker, that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. Let me know if you guys watched it. We did over here on this channel. We should restream it. We should restream some of them. It'd be funny. He, I don't think it was in the base. I don't, actually, Ozzy, I don't know where he stayed in the house. He might've been. And because I think they did say something about going downstairs for some reason. Now that you brought that up. Catherine, he came, he's, they're trying. Now she's throwing out other stuff. We got, I got stuff for days. <laughs> so I'm just going to skim through these. Um, like I'm literally just going to read you the title of these documents. Cause it says everything that you need to know in the title. This is the, this is from the 
If it's blue, it's going to be from Brian Kohlberger defense side. If it's pink, um, it's going to be, you know, the state side. So this is the defendant's 13th supplemental request for discovery. It pretty much, that's it. They want the 13th. They're asking for more discovery. I think they, they're thinking, right, that they're going to find something in there for Brian's alibi. But they're not. Case captivated you, wizard. Is this one of your, so let me know. Put, okay, yeah. Put a one in the chat. If this is the first true crime case that you've watched on YouTube, put a two in the chat. If this is not your first case you've seen on YouTube, like this was not what brought you into YouTube. You've been true crime YouTube in it up for a while. There's Cheryl. Oh, you need it for, oh yeah. That, Cause was your blood pressure high? I know if your blood pressure is high, they won't let you. Really? A lot of you guys came in on this case. Are you for reals? For reals, I said. For reals. Do you hear that? Wow. A lot of you guys, though. That chat at first was all one, 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 one. Wow. I didn't realize. I mean, I should have. It's a big case. Even Vincent's mom knew about this case. Like, and she's, I didn't know that she would know. Idaho brought you to YouTube. I was here by, I was sent here by Kylie Rodney. When she, when she was killed, I, that's how I got, I came into the mix and true crime, which I don't know why I didn't do true crime way before this. I didn't really have a, I had a channel, but it was just sitting there. Like no videos were on it. So like other than my prosthetic videos for my eye. And I think those were just more for me, not for anyone else to watch. Um, but this one is motion to file exhibit L attached to the defendant's 13 supplemental request for discovery. So, um, they're just filing. Looks like a, um, they want to seal an exhibit. We won't know what it is because it could hurt. It could jeopardize the case. It could um, put a witness in harm's way, you know, things of that nature. Gabby for you. Gabby for Cheryl. Johnny Depp auto. Watts, Mark. I kind of wanted to cover the Watts case just like in a couple or few, like, I don't want to like go too deep because I know how deep it goes. It goes crazy deep, but just to cover the, the case. Cause I, I, I'm interested in like knowing more because I, I don't, I haven't watched anything on YouTube, but that's where you got, that's where you get all the best news is here, here, Twitter. And if you're, if you're lucky and you know what you're looking for, Reddit, like some stuff's just bogus on there. But if you're looking in the right spot, you can find some stuff. And then this is just the order to file defendants exhibit. L attached. So they're just saying that, yep. Um, though that's ordered that they'll do, you know, they'll, um, seal it. So those are all the new documents. OJ Petito. I watched OJ, um, on TV when I was a kid. Well, actually we had to, because my dad, we had a VHS player. If you know anything about VHS players, you know, if you're recording something on the TV, nobody can watch nothing. You have to watch whatever you're recording. So OJ, the, the whole trial, I watched it all with Nancy yelling in the background. That's right. Um, so let's talk briefly about the last time that Brian Koberger was in court. I wrote some notes for you guys. <laughs> um, but no, the last time that they, they were in court was at the end of February. I think it was February 28th. Um, and Ann Taylor said that they planned to call over 400 witnesses. Brian Koberger don't even know 400 people. So um, are they going to try to put him in a venue at the middle of the night? That, that, I mean, there's no concert that runs in the middle of the night at three, between three and 4 a.m. So Walmart's not open anymore. Walmart's now closed. They're not 24 seven, which I didn't know that. I did not know that until um, like a couple weeks ago, literally. Elizabeth said too. <laughs> oh, thanks, Catherine. It was about the only thing to watch back then, but I'm a true crime. Oh, true crime on TV shows. I always do that. Really? Pin in 2017. Wow. Yeah, she has nothing. She's she's scrambling. She's trying. Um, so Bill Thompson the prosecutor, of course, he had a problem with her wanting to bring like all of those witnesses. So she's like, cause I mean, he don't care how many witnesses she brings forward, but he just is like, Hey, wait a minute. You guys haven't even established the alibi yet, your alibi defense. And 
you're already saying that you're calling 400 witnesses. Like what? You know, um, he just wants to know what their alibi is going to be a little bit. He wants to know, like, just give them, give them a little bit more than he was out driving around. Oh, um, wait, what? Between, and she says November 12th through November 13th, no potty break for him or nothing. So, um, yeah. Didn't Jay Logston say like putting the cart before the horse kind of sounds like that with the 400 witnesses. I don't know. He was saying all kinds of weird stuff. So you know how it is. <laughs> um, and also talked about change of venue and, um, saying that, you know, citing that Brian Kohlberger couldn't get a fair and impartial jury in Lake County. There's 25,000 people that live there. I'm sure they could find 12 to 16, 16 to 18. Got to have some alternates. I didn't even, Mary Beth, I didn't even see that. Thank you so much. Hey, Amanda. 400, yeah. I was reading, so when I read, I can't see. Thank you, Mary Beth. You got the memberships. I want to see. That's the best part. It's like the lottery. You know, I mean, literally, it's like the lottery because you don't know who's going to get them. And then, like, I don't know. I just, I really like gifting them, too, because then you just see who gets them. But I was reading, so it's hard for me to see. I have a trouble. I have trouble with the defense and vending an alibi. Yeah. Well, she's also now saying some other stuff. Like, I don't know. I really don't know. I'll get, um, I'm going to get to that part because she did say something different in court. Um. So he's going to have a decision on the trial date and the venue change on May 14th. Everybody mark your calendars. Three weeks. Three weeks. She's just trying to get paid for a few years. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, 200 an hour. Why wouldn't you? You know, shoot, I'll stay there all day. What do you want me to do? You just want me to hang out with this guy and try to defend him? I don't know. 200 an hour. Would you do it? an hour. I'd have to see what that equals out over the whole case. I'm just kidding. I don't think I, I couldn't be a defense attorney. I just couldn't, I could not be a defense attorney. I, now I could be a prosecutor. Like I could be a prosecutor. I could do that. I just could not be, a, I couldn't be a defense attorney. That's just me. Um, but he's going to have all of those decisions on May 14th. Um, April 17th is the deadline for the alibi. Um, he's ready to at least hear a little bit of what they're going to bring to trial. So um, something tangible, something other than like he was out driving around between, you know, 11, 12 and 11, 13, those two dates. Um, and she did say, let me see. She said, what did she say? So in court in February, we didn't go over this. I don't know why. Did you guys, do you guys remember hearing her say something like, we're going to prove that Brian Kohlberger was somewhere else on the night of the homicides. So, cause she said that. So I'm wondering uh, where is she going to put him? If you know what I mean? If she's bringing 400 witnesses, she's going to prove that he wasn't there, but she said he was driving around. Now I, mean, she, I think she's trying to um, confuse people and she's not doing a very good job. Cause I still think he's looks guilty of sin. The more and more she, you know, does the runaround. Hey, Ashley. Oh, that's so nice, Ashley. That's so sweet. She's a lucky, lucky lady. You heard it, Ozzy? Yeah, sure did. She said there was video proof of him somewhere other than the King Road house at the time of the murders. Yep, I want to see that too. Yeah. I think she puts those little, those little like tidbits in. Do you know what I mean? Like those little seeds of doubt. And then it makes people think like, wait a minute, what does she have? Does she have something? Does she have something we haven't seen? Do we, you know, I mean, I'm sure she does, but you know. He was hanging with Dylan. Who was? Oh, you think he was? Yeah. But her wording means he was, yeah. We need to, we need to go back and watch that. Yeah. Her wording was weird about that. It was like insinuating that he was there. Or something like it was, she shouldn't have said what she said. <laughs> I do remember that colorful language. Yes. 
Yeah. How could she prove it when they have cameras of him being at the house that night? If she, if the camera would have to literally be so good, which they have the cameras at the university that are capturing him coming to and from, they would have to be better than that out in the middle of nowhere, like getting him somewhere far away from the crime scene and zooming and being able to zoom in through the car window on his face. Like, or he's got to be physically sitting in a police station. Or I'm not going to believe it. I don't even think I believe a, a camera at this point. Got to sit in the police station. Just kidding. That'd be funny though. Um, University of Idaho murder suspect Brian Kohlberger is set to reveal new information on a possible alibi next month while a trial date is still unknown. In February, prosecutors in the case requested more information from Kohlberger's legal team on a possible alibi over the murders, which left four college student, um, students dead in November 2022. Judge John Judge, overseeing the case, set a deadline of April 17th for Kohlberger's legal team to provide documents relating to an alibi. Um, I think this is all the stuff that we've... So, yeah, Kohlberger's been arrested and charged with four counts of first-degree you know, murder. Um, with, I, said, I said their names, but I'll say it again. Kayla Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. Keep those names in your head. Because I have a feeling they're going to try to make this case fizzle out. Um, so this is in December 2022. Kohlberger was arrested at his parents' house in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. And he continues to maintain his innocence. Actually, you know what? He doesn't. He doesn't. I'm not going to read that last part. He doesn't maintain nothing. He hasn't said anything. He didn't say he wasn't guilty. He um, remained silent. What's your alibi? I was driving around. A man of few words. That Kohlberger. I haven't been in Brian's Girls in a while. I wonder how they're doing. Oh, just want to do a, like, um, intermission, if you will. Intermission time. Intermission. Tomorrow night, everybody get ready. We are deep, deep diving into the new Ruby Frank, Jody Hildebrandt, Kevin Frankie, all the Frankies, all the Hildebrandts. They're all going to, they all put out video. We all have videos of them. They're videos of them. Um, you, you don't want to watch them without a friend. If you do, trigger warning. They're out there on Law and Crime, Court TV. But they show the kids. They show what they were bound with. Oh my gosh, what and the interviews, y'all buckle up for tomorrow night because it's going to be good. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that in the beginning of the live and I forgot. And I just went to go pull up Nancy and I saw a, you know, thing of Ruby on there. She makes me sick and ill. And um, if you don't like cussing or me getting upset or mad, probably sit out tomorrow's life. But if you're into that kind of thing, come on in because when it comes to kids, I just I can't help myself. And oh my gosh, what I saw today, it was, it was horrific. But you know what I saw today? I saw Vincent as like a, not even just a great person, but as like a dad. Cause when I showed him the, and I showed him the pictures of like Russell, he said, who would ever do that to a kid? And he said, that makes no sense. Who would ever do that? But that, who would ever do that? Like, I, right. Who would ever do that? God bless him. God bless his heart. So oh, she just put this out on video a couple um, hours ago. We, we normally, I listen to the podcast, but I didn't even get a chance to listen to the podcast um, before we came on the live tonight because we did so many lives today. I am going to put her behind me because I do have my Nancy Grace. Now, Nancy, if you're listening, I love you. But I don't like that shirt. I don't like it, Nancy. I've told her before. I love her, but we got to get her out of that. This one, this one, this color isn't, but I do have two that are actually prettier than this one in my boutique and they're a little thicker. This is actually, um, I think from like Maurice's or something. So I'm going to start playing Nancy. I'm going to put her behind me here, you know, cause she's probably feeling, she's staring at me. I don't like it when she's over there. <laughs> um, if you guys don't mind just taking a second, hit the like button, all those fun things that we ask you to do on the live. And I'm going to go ahead and get right to it and play her. If you guys missed any of the beginning of the live, we basically just went over and Taylor and what she's been doing. She's been doing the mostest. She's trying to get um, people that SA kids under the age of 12 um, off of the death penalty. <laughs> she's out there. Um, what else? Is she, she's trying to get the Supreme Court to you know throw the case out, which they didn't even want to look at it. 
she's saying they're switching the alibi they're you know this alibi that alibi any alibi now i want to know if you can change your alibi once it's sealed like can you come back and be like ah we changed it i have to look that up i'm gonna look it up right now after our as we're watching this and i bet she's on fire Trial judge is Ooh. putting there she is. Brian Koberger's feet to the fire, saying, so what is your alibi? What is your fake alibi? Who said that? <laughs> what is your alibi? Lenora. Now, notice of alibi is due. The state is asking, could you be a little more specific than me just wandering around town? And the defense is now alluding to the fact they have witnesses that place Brian Koberger somewhere completely different than the crime scene on King Road where four beautiful young University of Idaho students are slaughtered in their own beds. Where? Where is he at 3 a.m.? I can't wait to hear this. Witnesses. What I want to know. I want to know. As I've told many a jury, nothing good happens after midnight. So where is Koberger going to tell us he was at 3 a.m. at the time of the murders? And what witnesses are going to bail him out of four murder one charges? You're seeing right there the murder scene. Some of those are photos I took. Do you think uh, that... Yeah, let's scroll through because you... Not to interrupt it already, but do you think the people are going to forget about the house. Like I've been thinking about that like the last few days. I do you think people are going to forget what it looked like, what it felt like? I don't just like what it felt like to be there, to be inside of it, to be around it after a few years, do you think? And by them I think like I'm talking about like surviving roommates. If it's not there like to refresh their memory and I've been I was all for house coming down, you know. But the last few days I've been thinking about it and I feel like I'm never going to forget about this house, but I mean, you know, you never know. Maybe I will in a few years. I feel like I won't though. He shouldn't be able to change it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to look that up actually right now. Thanks for reminding me. You can see exactly what was going on inside that home from what we believe to be Koberger's perch on a to just say incline in a parking area right yeah right there like where you're looking right now where you are standing viewer right there you can look right in to the home from that parking lot which is per it's really lit up i don't home. know if i go so in that way you want to tell me that's not where he was at 3 a.m wait i think he was up here in the front door nancy he make his entrance into this home under the cloak of darkness because I say that's exactly where he was. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. First of all, what is a judge looking for? Will they even respond? Or will somehow Koberger's defense team wiggle out of yet another judicial command? Listen to Nicole Parton, Crime Online. Judge John Judge set an April 17th deadline for Kohlberger's legal team to provide documents related to an alibi. Last year, at least two possible alibis were set out by Kohlberger's attorney. The first saying it was Kohlberger's habit to go for long drives alone late at night. Defense attorney Ann Taylor later gave the court brief information saying, quote, evidence cooperating Mr. Kohlberger being at a location other than the King Road address will be disclosed pursuant to discovery and evidentiary rules, as well as statutory requirements, unquote. The location has not been revealed. Liz, keep showing me Koberger. Wait, no, 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 don't show me me. Show me Koberger. Look at him. This guy, I mean, the jury's going to take one look at this and run as if they had seen a monster. I mean, that look in his eyes. You want to be alone in a room with this guy? Liz, can you give me something a little bit closer to his face? Do you want to be? Look at I mean, to be fair, Nancy, I'm terrified of you too, but just in a different way. Okay, there you go. It looks almost normal right there. No. Kind of like, 
almost a smile, approaching a smile. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I don't want to be the same. <laughs> oh my yeah. lord! Unless I was trying him for four counts of murder. Could you imagine? All star panel makes sense of what we know right now. First to Maureen Callahan with DailyMail.com and author of Ask Not the Kennedys and the Women They Destroyed. Oh, you're going to need a volume two for that, Maureen Callahan. But that said, back to Koberger. What alibi? Alibi, my rear end. I can't wait to hear this. Okay, and the judge is basically ordering them because under the law, and I'm going to get with Tara Malik about that, uh, a high-profile lawyer in that jurisdiction, about, hey, you can't, the defense can't say, oh, yeah, I've got an alibi. No, no, no. Notice of alibi has to be more specific so the state will be prepared to respond. And I mean, and of course, I'm going to go to Della Torre in a moment. What kind of alibi is that? Creepy dude driving round and round and round in circles at 3 a.m.? Uh-uh. They got to come up with something better than that. But to you, Maureen Callahan, tell me what's happening. Koberger is now being forced to hand over, fork over an alibi. That's got to hurt. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it strains credulity that this guy who is on trial for one of the most savage murders of this young century, seemingly so random, so brutal, uh, is taking about two years to come up with an alibi witness in what is, you know, the trial of his life. Uh, it also strains credulity, you know, in a post 9-11 world, we live in a 24-7 surveillance state. Whether or not he left his phone at home or left it off, his car was spotted on surveillance cams, blood with a 99.99998% chance of belonging to a biological male not in his bloodline was found at the crime scene. He was stalking at least one of these victims on Instagram well before the murders. He was spotted driving around the house well before the I'm just going to say, I think, I don't know. Would you all enter a house if it was lit up like that through the back door when the front is not so lit up? I know I've been saying, I know I've been saying this for a long time. It'll be two years. It'll be probably three years before we go to court, but you know, just it's, it's really lit up back there. Just think about that. I don't know. Y'all let me know. I wouldn't go in the back door. It's lit up like the 4th of July, but that's just me. So I personally think, and I've been saying this since November something, I would say November, well, December maybe, I don't know. There's a video out there that he, I, I believe he went in that front door. I know so many people, they, people be yelling at me in the chat. They were like, no, we did it. Because, you know, it was crazy in the beginning with Idaho. I think we've all simmered down a little bit. I have. I was the worstest there until September. And then I was like, you got to take a step back. Also, they never collected the trash. I want to know what's in the trash. Tell me what's in the trash. The murders. He had broken into a female friend's house. Before that's true, the Jeff. They and usually, I think, had that those lights on. All digital cameras to spy on her. Well, that's true. When he went home after the murders, around the holidays, even his own family, including notably, like his look at sister, that, began to suspect that he had done it, and went and searched his car, which they were surprised a little to find had been thoroughly scrubbed with bleach. I mean, you know, the, the, the mountain of evidence is substantial. So it's an insult to a jury that will hear this case to say it has taken so very long to unearth this most crucial witness. You know what? I, I'm stealing everything you just said, all of it, because it's all <laughs> right. And I especially like the turn of phrase you use it strains credibility b s mm -hmm. let's break it down they're lying that's what it is an outright lie but i like the way that you said that it's it strains credibility you know i want to talk about everything that she just said because right now the judge in the brian koberger murder trials has demanded that the defense hand over their alibi. Now, to you, Tara Malik, high-profile lawyer, joining us out of that jurisdiction. You can find her at smithmalik.com. I still think your name should be first, but that said, Tara Malik, um, as we all know, under the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, 
gives you the right to remain silent. You don't have to give an alibi. You don't have to bring on a witness. You don't have to give evidence. You don't have to speak. You don't have to do any of that. And the jury will be instructed that they cannot hold any of that, particularly the defendant's right to remain silent, against the defendant. And they have to agree to that. Typically, they do during voir dire or jury selection, which coincidentally means to speak the truth. So Tara Malik, since the defense does not have to say anything, then how is it? And put it in a nutshell, how is it this, the judge could say, hand over your alibi now? How does that happen? They seem to be in direct contradiction. Well, Koberger, you're exactly right, did not have to say anything, and he certainly didn't have to present an alibi. He decided he wanted to. And what is just incredible in this situation is that it's not a typical alibi where you would say something like, I was at Mr. Smith's house, you know, from two in the morning until noon the next day. What they said instead was, I like to take drives at night, where you know, what does that do? What it does is corrobor corroborate part of the state's case here, which is he was not home and he was in an unknown location. So now instead of having to prove that Koberger was not in fact home, all they have to prove is, well, he's already admitted folks that he was out for a drive somewhere and they just have to shore up that last little bit that where he was going and where he ended up was this house. Okay, they so did make the job, this. they uh, did kind of make the prosecutor's job a little easier when they came out with that alibi. I never thought about that because now they got him out of the house. So he can't say I was at home. You know, like he can't like, you know, he, they're, they're going to be able to place him within that window. They're going to put his little car on the video cameras. I mean, universities, colleges like that, cameras are ridiculous. There are so many of them and they are so good. So, and he was seen on those. So, I mean, phew, that's not going to be a good idea for him when he sees himself cruising by. Wouldn't that be something? Um, Chris McDonough. Chris McDonough, I found Chris McDonough on the interview room on YouTube. He's got his own channel. And I, I can't remember what search I put in, but it was late at night. It was like one o'clock in the morning. I'm still awake researching Koberger. I hadn't been to the crime scene yet. Um, it's just before I had gone. And I found McDonough, I think with Honey, his wife. She was trolling, was she said. Driving about literally two miles an hour. And it was perfect because they were pointing out here is, just for instance, the Exxon station. Here's that. And if you go forward and you turn left, you go up a hill. And it's very uh, concentrated. And the, the, the streets are very narrow. And it was if I was driving through the neighborhood myself. And as a matter of fact, that quick check or whatever that gas station was on the corner turned out to be, I doubt uh, that Chris McDonough knew it at the time, that he showed us turned out to be critical. Because a clerk, and I think it was a female clerk, took it upon herself voluntarily to go through days and days, painstakingly, a video surveillance and catches a white Elantra speeding by that little gas station at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Bam! That was a huge piece of evidence. And I had actually seen it on a drive along, a virtual drive along with Chris McDonough. And the moment I got out there, I couldn't wait to meet up with Chris, to find out everything he knew. Now, I want to ask you, Chris McDonough, you go on a drive about, which means you had nowhere else to be at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That was some drive, wasn't it, from his place uh, that coincidentally led him to. I want to talk about that for just a second. So, Back in my videos, and I'm going to go back and check this out one day. I keep, always forget till she brings it up. Nancy Grace may, had a video. She, she, went, she was there at the crime scene. She set up her table. She had her neon green gloves with her blue puffer jacket. She was ready to go. Her kid made her her gloves. She did the drive. She did the drive all the way to Brian Kohlberger's from the crime scene. And I believe she did it all the way back to and from 
she recorded the whole time. It's scrubbed from the interwebs now. You can only find like a 10 and an eight second clip of it on her Facebook from when it, she posted it. If anybody finds the whole video, send it to my email. I'll owe you big time because I've looked everywhere. So we're going to have to go back because it's it's a drive and it's really dark and it's really weird. It's just like, I don't know. You, I feel like if you're new to the area, you wouldn't make that drive at night. Just wouldn't. The crime scene at King Road. You would get lost maybe. Picture of that. The crime scene at the time that they were murdered, right? That's quite the, the bad luck for him, right? The coincidence. And then we were hearing Maureen Callahan with DailyMail.com describing uh, that he did, I, she just said didn't have his phone or didn't have it turned on. But then when he did turn it on, we realized he is pinging a distance away from the house and takes a long circuitous route back home and I timed it myself, Chris, as I'm sure you've done. There it is. It took me over an hour to get from the crime. But that's all we. That's all we get. Now, all the way back to that's. You and know, it wasn't fast forward like that either. Anyway, from Fraternity Row, all the way back to uh, Washington State University, where he was in school getting his PhD. An hour, but if he had taken the normal route, it would have been about eight minutes. What a coincidence that he happens to place himself with his own alibi, much like Scott Peterson. Yeah, I was at the marina where her body washed up. That I was there the day she went missing. There. He's really placing himself at the crime scene, Chris McDonough. Does anybody get that? Yeah, I mean, you're a thousand percent right. Again, Nancy, I mean, think about it, right? You know, some other dude uh, did the crime, but I happened to be in the neighborhood. Uh, oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, I had my phone turned off uh, the whole time. But every other time I've been in the neighborhood, yeah. uh, I've had my phone on. Okay? And, you know, it's almost, I can't wait. Ruby Frankie's hear, daughter. And, and you, more than anybody, have been in that courtroom, you know, a hundred times with these kind of guys. And you think to yourself, you know, wait a minute, what's the opening statement going to be from the defense? Because that's how, that's the only thing they're going to have at that moment. And it's interesting that you just said, you know, he's going to, you know, start producing all of these witnesses that are going to buy this alibi out there, you know, some other dude. So I, I, when you drive up that road, you, your whole um, sense of, oh my gosh, this guy knows this neighborhood. It, it just comes so clear to anybody that that took that drive or will take that drive. Well, let's refresh your recollection on this. Maureen Callahan joining us, dealingmail.com and author of Ask Not, The Kennedys and the Women They Destroyed. Again, you're going to need a volume two. But that said, Maureen Callahan, didn't pings and other information place him, Brian Koberger, in close proximity to the murder scene about 11 times before the night the co-eds and Ethan Chapin were murdered? They did, Nancy. I believe it may have been 12. And, you know, that information just doesn't lie. What possible reason did that young monster have to be in that neighborhood seemingly surveilling that house and look at how cute her background was up, it was really cute incredibly important i believe it shows he turned the cell phone off at 12 47 and it comes back on at 4 48 so that would be the window of time that these savage murders are being committed and you know when we talk about the delay of this trial um which is let's look at that for a second because there's a lot of people out there that are like Brian Koberger, and you may be one of them. I mean, it's okay too. I'm, you know, I'm got my opinion, you got yours, you know, we're cool. Um, but they say he's absolutely innocent, innocent, didn't do it, wasn't there, didn't do it. Well, let's just see. At 2 42, his phone pings at his apartment, and then his phone heads south. 
going towards Moscow. Then his phone's turned off. That's weird. I don't turn my phone off in the car. It doesn't go dead because you have a car charger normally in your car to charge your phone. Normally you're listening to music through your phone or something. Um, 2.47, the phone's turned off. But then there's the passes that you see. But then at 4.48, all of a sudden, phone's back on. Like exactly almost two hours later. Oh, my cat wants out. He, my co-host wants me to leave. Wants to leave me. But you know what I mean? If you see it like here, if you, I mean, this is a visual. This makes me go, oh, wow. Wow. You know, that's, now that looks like he could be guilty, you know. you know, really, to my mind, making a laughing stock of the American criminal. Justice. And that's one other thing, too. We never got, like, this was the mugshot that we got of Brian Koberger. Like, where's the rest of it? Why is he sitting down? Why didn't we get the height, weight, all that jazz? Birth date? Anyone know? I'm wondering. Justice system. I think it's important to remember that there were two young people in the house who survived that night. One of whom a young woman who actually saw him exiting the house and froze in a sort of very animalistic fear response. You know, where is the justice, not just for these families, but for these surviving victims who will carry this with them their entire lives? Where is the fear that memories will fade or become even more fungible, that the defense might really have something to leverage there. Um, I, you know, I, I, I said this in a column I wrote about the piece that even the name of the judge presiding in this case, judge, judge, who can't seem to make things happen. It feels, it feels like a kangaroo court. I agree with you, Maureen Callahan, and I've been on the judge's side so far, but, uh, as a trial lawyer, I love her background. I love it. Cases that I've lost count of them. I'll sh don't remind me. I'll show you my new background from my other channel. Well, up into the thousands that I no longer have count of all the guilty pleas I took on felony cases. This is insane. I mean, the incident happened all the way back in November 2022, November 13, 2022, as I recall. And they don't want to have the trial until at best summer of 25. That means we're approaching November of 25 will be uh, years. In three years yeah. since the incident. Yeah. Uh, back to I'm gonna three years. Wow. Delay, 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 delay. The defense best friend. Uh, you lose witnesses. Witnesses die. Witnesses move. They can't be found. Their memories become clouded. You lose pieces of evidence. Everything changes. The house has already been torn down now. There's no way to take the jury over there, even for a drive-by. That opportunity is gone. What else are we going to lose before this judge finally moves this case to trial? And it is on him. Yes, I know this is a death penalty case. Death penalty cases require more time to prepare. That's enough time. That's too much time. Now the defense is whining. They need more time. But I want to get back before I address the delay aspect, which is really being fueled by the judge, as you pointed out, judge, judge. I want to address the alibi situation because now the defense is teasing. They actually have witnesses to support that Brian Koberger wasn't on the scene. Could I please see the BK timeline again? This is what we know regarding pings and finding him on video surveillance, 2.42 a.m. His phone is at his apartment at Pullman, where he's getting his Ph.D. at a different college. 2.42, he heads south. 2.47, he's in his car. Wow, I think I'll save my battery. He cuts the phone off like this. AC, anal compulsive dude, did not have a charger in the car. No way. 3.29. 3.29 a.m. after he cuts his phone off. We're talking about about 40 minutes later. There he goes by the King Road residence three times in his white Elantra. Phone off, but busted, man. You got your <laughs> surveillance video. You're not getting out of that. Could you be? Could you imagine? Could you imagine Nancy if she was still like a um hey 
Hey, gal. Gail, gal, Gail, um, I was trying to prove your comment while reading this at the same time. Could you imagine if Nancy was the prosecutor on this case or any case still? I always say we need to find her old videos. We really do need to find some old Nancy videos of her in the courtroom. I would have been terrified. I'd be like, I'm guilty. Walk in, I'm guilty. He turns and he stops in front I'm of terrifying. the house. Surveillance video. She said busted. To us. <laughs> 420. The sedan leaves the area at a high speed. 448, phone ping. The phone's back on south of Moscow, State Highway 95. And let me tell you something. I got in the car and I drove that route at night in the dark of night after midnight. Release the tapes overnight. again, Nancy. Street lights. The whole when tape. A, a big rig would come toward me. I'd practically have to pull off the side of the road. It's a two lane. And it's just like every two lane, 50, you go 55, 45, 55 down that. It's a back road. We mean, Nancy, you never lived in the out in the sticks. Yeah, she's from the sticks. I'm pretty sure she's from country. This is the country. It's just a country back road. Four o'clock in the morning let that sink into the jury you know this guy's out driving around alone at four o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. turns Devon, off too. his cell phone at coincidentally once again a coincidence the same time mm -hmm. the four beautiful university of idaho students are murdered okay he's in his car driving around who is going to be his alibi witness Take a listen to Sydney Sumner, Crime Online. The prosecutors and Koberger's defense have not been able to reach an agreement on a trial start date. Lada County Prosecutor Bill Thompson requested the trial begin on March 3, 2025. The defense attorney for Koberger, Ann Taylor, says she needs more time to review evidence and requested the trial begin no sooner than June 2025. The judge will decide the exact date, but with it happening in 2025, the trial will be live streamed by the court. Whether Brian Koberger's murder trial begins in March or June, Ann Taylor has mentioned the defense expects to have 400 witnesses as well as a wide variety of evidence to show at trial. Witnesses, witnesses, are they alibi witnesses? Let's just pass through this to you, uh, Chris McDonough. You have driven the route just like me. Who along that route could possibly have witnessed him not being at the crime scene, let's just say between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. Who? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, 400 people, apparently. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, 400 witnesses. I, it has know, to be a stadium. I, uh, where are you going to find 400 witnesses, number one alibi witnesses? Wait, 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 course, wait, wait. Let, let's get know, it straight. I'm asking yeah. the question. Yeah. You're <laughs> getting the answers. Q and A. <laughs> I'm the Q. You're the A. Okay, okay. let's go. <laughs> what i'm checking out i'm checking out i'm checking out i lied when i said i wanted to be in chris mcdonough's seat when i said that that's my seat he can have it she just said what i asked the questions around here she said this ain't a this is a q and a i'm the q you're the a. god i love her i just love her so much <laughs> That's the funniest thing I think I've heard on the internet, at least today. Okay, at least today. That made me laugh. I needed that. We're going to go back and listen to that one again because, good God, she's funny. I need that on a shirt. Driven the route just like me. Who along that oh, sorry, route I can back a little bit could further. possibly there have is. witnessed him <laughs> not being at I'll try not to laugh in your guys' ear this time. I'll mute myself. Who? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's... It just doesn't make sense. I mean, 400 witnesses, I, you know, I, I, where are you going to find 400 witnesses, number one, alibi witnesses? I'm wait, 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 let, let's get it straight. I'm asking yeah. the questions. Yeah. You're giving the answers. Q and A. <laughs> I'm the Q. You're the A. Okay, okay. let's go. Who in the on, A let's go. could have been a witness? Somebody at a gas station? No, 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 no. Not a gas station. Who could have, who could be the alibi witness they're alluding to? Well, Remember, you get those kind of witnesses, and witness testimony is is the worst testimony you could ever. Eyewitness testimony is the worst um, because you know so many variants 
right? And so many factors that change instantaneously. I, I suspect they're going to find people that go, yeah, I kind of look like that, but that that's not the guy. Uh, we're going to get a lot of that, I think. Also, uh, you're going to have, you know, friends coming up. Look at, I mean, this guy's sitting in jail and he's getting love letters. Okay? Those are the kind of witnesses that you'll get, uh, you know, and, you know, who knows what's, what's going to come out of the, you know, the magic hat when they reach in and, the, you know, they stick their hand and they pull something out. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy and, to delay this. Like and this. just as Maureen Callahan, yeah, I, I, I still see how they're going to have a, an alibi witness. I, I don't believe it. And what that means, what would it be? Uh, Tara Mal Malik. Think about that for a minute. I mean, really, three or four in the morning, three or four in the morning, Idaho, 400 people. I don't, I don't know because Walmart's not open 24 seven anymore. And thank you, Jeff. I looked it up. Thank you. And that, that looks like it's what it is. Mine came, mine was second one down. I was like, Oh, look at me. Um, not forgot what I was saying, but yeah, I just don't think that, yeah, it's not going to work. Not working. You're the high profile lawyer in the Idaho jurisdiction. If they don't have an alibi witness, 400 people. I mean, I don't know where you're going to find that many people. Scene, in that, narrow window of time when we believe the murders occurred and we can in fact nail it down because of uh, the time they came home late that night after a night of co-ed partying and going to food trucks and walking in and out of fraternity row they they get home we know that they made a DoorDash delivery they got the delivery we know what time that was by their phones we know that they're on their phones texting and playing games at a certain time so we know they were alive at that time. And based on the pings, when he turns his phone back on, we know the murders had to occur in that time. So go with me, Tara. If there is no witness, no alibi witness, then the only witness to that would be him, which means he would have to stay to take the stand. He Brian Koberger would have to take the stand to establish his alibi. That will be a cold day in hell because he will be torn oh, Nancy. on cross-examination. Nancy, put a $3 in this swear jar. She's in trouble. She usually says H-E double hockey sticks or H-E double L-L. He absolutely will be torn apart. I mean, it's that all one tonight. A prosecutor's dream for him to take the stand. How is he going to explain the ninth sheath and his DNA? How is he going to explain turning his phone off? How is he going to explain his actions immediately after these murders, leaving the state, leaving the state with his dad, cleaning out the car with bleach? I mean, he would have a really tough time on the stand explaining his actions to a jury in a way that would be. Uh, even remotely believable. So I don't think that he's going to be put on the stand by Ann Taylor. I would be absolutely shocked. And, and as far as his alibi, if he had an alibi, if he wasn't there, I mean, this is a huge Nancy, don't give a fudge. case. This is a just heinous crime. And if he wasn't around, why is it that we are just hearing about these witnesses? If it were anybody else who'd been charged with four heinous murders like this, horrendous murders, why wouldn't they be running to the prosecutor's office or law enforcement immediately and going, here are the, you know, 100 people, 30 people, whatever yeah. number they want to throw out there, who can corroborate that it wasn't me, I wasn't around. The fact that it's taken- Even if it was one person, I'd be going to take it to the DA. Judge. Alibi together in and of itself is suspect. Tara Malik, you are exactly correct. Why not on day one go, I, I was at so-and-so. I was sleeping over at my girlfriend's place. I, I was out uh, playing pool at so and so. Well, you don't have a girlfriend. You don't have friends. I, I was drinking at this bar until closing time. They turned the lights on and off, and I finally left. Why not? You're right. It has taken since the time of the murders, November 13, 2022, to come up with the alibi. And here's the other kicker, Tara Malik. Once you commit to an alibi, you're screwed because uh, as long as you don't say anything, that means you have the ability 
to say anything at trial. But once you commit to an alibi as they have, he likes to take long drives at night. Uh, oh, okay. You're stuck with that. You are stuck with your words once you say that. Absolutely, you are. You're absolutely, he didn't have to say a thing. He absolutely, he did not have to uh, indicate that he had an alibi to begin with. He could have just put the state to its burden and say, you know, prove it beyond a reasonable doubt and gone from there. But instead, they took this affirmative action of saying, we have an alibi. We'll let you know later on what that looks like and who it is, which is not an alibi um, to begin with. Let's just be clear on that point. But, but he's taking this stand now that there's going to be some sort of alibi. And it's also strange because, you know, it, it wasn't like he entered a not guilty plea in this case during his arraignment either. He stood silent. So he's standing silent, he say nothing. not entering a not guilty plea. Would you guys do that? No, under no circumstance. I don't care what it's deserved. I'm not under none. Now, I may not, I probably wouldn't speak without an attorney present when I was questioned. That makes sense. But if they're literally asking you to put in a plea for murders, I mean, not just like murders, they're horrendous crimes, heinous, terrifying. I mean, we know we know from Kaylee's mom and dad that she was found scooted up in the bed with her, like slouched over because she was trying to get away from whoever it was. Don't you think that you would plead either guilty or not guilty, you would say something. I would. At that point in time, that's when my mouth would open and words would come out of it. Even if it was like, you know, even if I didn't say something like to the investigators and I wanted to have an attorney, because you know, like sometimes that's messy. You don't know the law. I would definitely be saying something by he, trial. Uh, by not court. disclosing his alibi. I mean, the whole thing makes no sense. And it's very confusing. I should make that a, a Wes, I should make that a poll. And now we're hearing that the judge can't seem to move the case along, get it to go to trial until nearly three years since the murders. That's BS, technical legal term. Take a listen to what the families, uh, for instance, of Kaylee Gonzalez have to say. The families of Kaylee Gonzalez and Xander Canodal issued a public statement sharing their frustration in not having a trial start date yet. Latah County Prosecutor Bill Thompson says he could be ready to present his case in March of 2025, while Koberger's lead attorney, Ann Taylor, says she will not be ready until June 2025. Taylor also says she plans to call 400 witnesses in a trial expected to last six weeks. In their open letter, the Gonzalez and Cronodo family statement begins with, why are victims' families so misunderstood? The okay, I wanted to ask you guys something really quick, and I don't want to forget. Do you think, okay, because they said that the Gonzalez family said that they haven't gotten her phone back yet, but I believe they got the digital download of it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Do you think the night of the homicides when Kaylee and Maddie are at the food truck, I'm sure we've all seen that video more times than we can probably count, but it looks like when Maddie grabs the food out of the window, Kaylee is like taking a picture of like a video or something of some sort. Do you think that her parents have seen that video? Like, I wonder if they've seen that, if it, that was really a video she took. Because remember, we all speculated. We don't know. But I'm wondering now. Although, I think there's something on the physical phone. Like, I don't think there's something in the phone. I think there's something on the phone. That's why they're keeping it. That's my personal thing, I think. Not like... Like something, like something on the phone, like maybe his DNA, maybe his blood, maybe something of his spit, saliva, biologicals. They might not have, they might not have tested the phone right away. And that's why we don't know anything about it because it wasn't in the PCA because they didn't need to put it in there. We never know. We're not going to neutral trial. With, we but want it could be. Healing. We do. We want to find justice and try to move hey, on from this horrible tragedy. In. So please, please start making some decisions. Hmm. Amen. Amen, brother. Start making some decisions, judge, judge, judge. Do something. There should not be a three-year delay. Of course, the mm -hmm. judge does not want to jeopardize the death penalty case and get a reversal on appeal if there is a conviction. But three years? No. H-E-L-L-N-O. Way too long. And let me tell you, uh, John, Dr. John Delatore, uh, 
I had a case. An incident occurred when I was in law school. The case was tried. There were clear errors. Two defendants were tried together, and both of their statements came in where they blamed each other. You can't do that. It's called interlocking statements. You have the right to cross-examine a, uh, by the way, that, that that is Chris McDonough, that it's not Dr. John Delatory. Uh, you have the right to cross-examine any witness brought on against you. And so when your co-defendant blames you, you can't call the co-defendant to the stand if they take the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So I had this case, Dr. Delatory, that was tried when I was in law school and went all the way up to one level before the U.S. Supremes, came back down for a retrial. Fourteen years later, I got the case to retry. You know what was left, Del Torrey? I went in the evidence room. There was one x-ray. I didn't know what it went to, but I could clearly see a bullet in it. And a baseball cap that said, kiss my bass. What was I supposed to do with that? It took me painstaking work <laughs> literally around the clock to put that case back together again. I'm happy to report both co-defendants were tried separately and were convicted and are still behind bars today. Dr. Delatory delay, 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 defense best friend. But what is it doing psychologically to the victim's families? It's destroying them. It's ongoing torture. It's absolutely ongoing torture as to what's going on with these families. Like they said, they just want justice. They, they, they want the machinations of the judicial system to work. But here's the problem is that it's not working in their favor. If this is supposed to be about justice, right, we're not seeing justice for the family members. If this is supposed to be about fairness and equity, sure, Brian Koberger de de deserves fairness and equity, but so do the family members. He violated the rights of these individuals. They should still be alive, and they're not. And they have, they should have the right for their own speedy trial in order for them to move forward with the healing process. You know what? Not only are the victims' families being destroyed psychologically, the way that the victims were destroyed physically is adding so much pain to these family members. Let's just do a quick reality check as you're looking at the bright, vibrant, happy faces of these four young people. You don't really read about them in the headlines anymore. Look at them. They've lost their lives. You're seeing pictures there. There's Ethan. He had a brother a beloved brother. We often hear about the girls, the girl victims, because many people like myself believe that one of them was the main target of Koberger. I don't want Ethan to get lost in the sauce. But every day their case becomes more and more distant. To Dr. Michelle Dupree, my longtime colleague and now friend, renowned medical examiner, forensic pathologist, a former detective with Lexington County Sheriff's, and author of Money, Mischief, and Murder, the Murdoch Saga. That also will require volume two, but more important for my purposes, she is literally, she literally wrote the book. She's the author of Homicide Investigation Field Guide. Could you explain just so we don't ever forget what happened to these four young people with their lives in front of them. Nancy, from what I've read and, and seen, this was the most horrific crime. I mean, the, the, the rage that was carried out on these young people and the absolute devastation of their bodies I, I can't even think about it. It was just horrific. It was horrific. And I want to say something about the, the witnesses that Koberger supposedly has. We know that eyewitnesses are only accurate about 50% of the time, 50%. So this whole thing is crazy. They need to make a decision. The judge needs to start this trial and give this family some closure and time to heal. Well, let's just start with the murder weapon. 
we know what the murder weapon is because the killer left left the sheath dummy this is a fixed blade unlike they're huge too a switch blade or a pin knife. it's bigger than the damn knife i don't know why it looks so small there look at that hold up a second y'all <laughs> where did they get this picture and what universe is that knife going to fit in that knife sheath? Good golly, Miss Jolly. That's, yeah, that's not what it looks like. The sheath is bigger than the dang knife itself because the knife fits in the sheath. They're huge. And we saw, when I saw it in person, I couldn't believe how big. I wasn't that impressed with the knife. I was more impressed with the sheath. I was like, dang, this is big. I mean, it's big. It's big. Knife. How do I know what kind? Because Koberger ordered the identical well, I like them both. sheath and Actually, I like knife them both. Uh, on Amazon. Frosted Flakes we with milk, Fruit order. Loops with not milk. He with plain. ordered this <laughs> knife. Now, the knife itself has never been found. The sheath, however, was found almost under one of the victim's bodies with Koberger's DNA on the snap where he had snapped and unsnapped that knife. Let's see it again. If you look at the sheath, it has a snap that closes down, right? It is behind the handle. That sheath folds over and snaps. That's where his DNA was found. Look at the knife. Look at the knife, Dr. Dupree. That is the type knife used to murder these four victims. And I have long said one of the most painful and brutal deaths is a knife death. Why? That's right, Nancy. I mean, this is a sharp force instrument. You know, when you even a paper cut on your finger, can you imagine a knife like that being thrust into your body all over and several times in so many places? And then absolutely all the blood around it's just horrific. Multiple stab wounds. One of the blades. that's been the rumor that um so um Myron um they said that that's been like a a source came forward. You know what I mean? <laughs> source came forward and said that he bought the knife sheath on Amazon, I guess in May or something. But I guess we'll find out during trial. You know, what he, when he, what he ordered, when he ordered it, who he talked to, who he stalked, if he stalked anybody, if he had an Instagram, if he didn't have an Instagram, if he was following one of the girls, if he wasn't, I think, I think trial might like, um, I'm, it might shock all of us, you know, what if, and I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't think this is true. I'm just saying, what if we get to trial and all of us think, you know, he has, it's either he's been looking at Kaylee or Maddie, you know, that's one of the targets we a lot of people think, you know, majority of people think it's one of them. Imagine if it was like Ethan. Or imagine if we get to trial and he went there to unalive somebody and he thought they were somebody else. Then he un unalived through other people because they saw him. You know what I mean? I don't know. These are all very big conspiracies. I'm just throwing them out. I'm just saying like, I think once we get to trial, we might be shocked. And I don't think it's going to be like shocked like he's innocent. It's going to be shocked, like, what in the world did this guy do? And, like, what did he do? Some We're going to get the who, what, when, where, and why. These and how. Law enforcement had ever or Xana Auto, seen. yeah. I'm literally I was just trying to put the most, per, like, you know, Ethan's, like, the furthest person I feel like. But you never know. Over what they've seen. Jump in, Chris. Thank you. You know what? I, I got to tell you, because to your point there for a moment, that – when you get to these types of scenes, immediately the cast off, the, the type of savagery that takes place uh, because that knife is a very personal weapon uh, to the suspect. And, and, and the victim that sees this item coming at him, in this case, it's a K-Bar, United States Marine Corps military killing machine. That it's a tool to kill. And those officers, those absolutely, it's not going to break, it's I, not going to bend, it's not going to break and bend, it's not going to lose its sharpness. It's just not, I mean, not after, I mean, it's going to take a lot. Those things are sharp, sharp, sharp. I can tell you, I've stood in crime scenes and looked up the ceiling while the ME like they're made is to kill people, the victim, 
and I'm counting cast off, you know, from that knife on every stab wound, and we're trying to correlate those two together. But in this case, he starts with two, and he's got two more to go. This guy is as evil and as brutal as it can get in those things. And not only are the cops going to be uh, having those memories for the rest of their lives, but the family has uh, not only getting pulled through this uh, non-decision uh, problem with this judge, but they're also going to have to see all of this that's coming. Uh, you know, God bless them. Well, speaking of that, Chris McDonough, you're right. Back to Dr. John Delatore. Dr. Delatore, I had similar reactions and still do, having been a victim of violent crime myself. It's hard for family members and loved ones of the murder victims to reconcile a ton of steaming hot BS with legal rights. Like mm -hmm. they hear alibi they're like oh hell no he doesn't have an alibi what is this bs he's trying to unload in the courtroom when we know as lawyers that the defense has a right to put up an alibi even if it's a big fat lie it's the worst one ever so this is excruciating like, why him. didn't he just say when they asked him where were you november 13th 2022 personally me i could say i was in bed between those hours i was in bed because i don't go anywhere but he should have just said I don't know. I don't know. Or don't provide an alibi defense. But if you're going to say, I don't know. I could have been at home. Could have been out. But don't say you've been out driving around. I've just been driving around. Family no gas. No, no bathroom stop. Years, no snacks. Three years after. I was the state to file for a speedy trial. Three years after the murders. And now they're hearing Koberger is going to have an alibi and they're having to basically hold their feet to the fire to get witnesses to the alibi. I mean, this is excruciating. The legal process is just torturing the families of these victims. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is what it means when we say terms like time is relative. So for most of us, right, this three years, yes, we're all up in arms about the delay that's happening, but three years is going to pass for us in an instant. For these family members, each day, each hour, each minute is excruciatingly long. Each time, each experience that it gets brought up is just expands the time frame with which their trauma and everything that's going on with them is happening to them. And until there's a resolution that they can accept, it's going to be like a, a, a wound reopening time and time and time again. To you, Tara Malik, the right to present an alibi, of course, is guaranteed under the Constitution, your defense. And the state nor the judge can interfere uh, with your ability to put up your defense. But this has really got to be tortuous to the victim's families because they don't believe there is an alibi and that whatever alibi the defense is presenting is a big lie. Absolutely. It is really difficult for victims' families in situations like this to have to sit through a trial and listen to um, a, an alibi, you know, be cobbled together like it's, you know, being attempted in this situation. Um, especially under these I'd yell if I was the one with parents. There's absolutely no clarity at all. Like, I don't mean to interrupt it. I'm not going to interrupt it anymore. But can you imagine being one of the family members literally, like, sitting in court? And he's like, my, like, Ann Taylor's like, his alibi is that he was out driving around. Like, <sighs> Steve Gonzalez must have the patience of a freaking bull. Because, I mean, man, that's crazy. Well, about what this alibi really looks like and whether or not there are well, the other parents He's who can really corroborate very, that uh, Koberger um, was somewhere else and couldn't have, you know, uh, committed yeah, these murders. That's, that's right, um, Tara, because they're saying he has an alibi. Uh, right now we're getting two theories. He likes to go on long drives alone at four o'clock in the morning. And 
that there is, Ann Taylor, the defense lawyer, has said there's going to be evidence corroborating Koberger, quote, being at a location other than the King Road address, and that location will be disclosed pursuant to discovery and evidentiary rules. I mean, if I had an alibi, I'd be screaming it to the top. I'm looking at Jackie, shaking her head, yes. I'd be screaming it on day when I wasn't there. I was at X, but that didn't happen, did it? Because it's a lie. This is what's happening to Maureen Callahan joining us, columnist for the DailyMail.com. I love your columns, by the way. Uh, Maureen Thank Callahan, you. I understand that there is a hearing set for April where the alibi is going to be disclosed. Do you know about that? I know nothing about what this alibi is uh, going to be, nor the uh, context for the disclosure. Can't wait to hear it can't wait to hear it. You know, as I was listening to your other guests and experts, I was thinking about what this trial, uh, insofar as it's developing with this like years long gestational period, really sort of why it's striking such a nerve. And I think there's something about what seems to be the white glove treatment that be is being afforded the suspect. When you look at images of him in court, he's in there without handcuffs. He's in there without being surrounded by law enforcement. If he is, sure is. is what the prosecution he opens is the door him with, which for himself. Most reasonable people think is absolutely the case. He is a very dangerous individual. Holds it open for the he officers. Come on, guys. Be enjoying the dragging out of this process to refuse to enter vocally his own not guilty plea is an fu to the court <laughs> to make the judge do it. And I think what this goes to is this overall sense that right now in America, like, why is her picture down, hanging up right there? Up, it is criminals who are getting the benefit of the doubt, the gentler treatment, while it's law abiding citizens who are really being made to suffer uh, in multiple ways. You see it across the board in this country right now. And when you have the families of the victims making a very rational, public plea please do not destroy the crime scene please do not destroy this house it is without question any jury is going to want to walk through i mean you guys were just going sort of through the drive that you both took to sort of really comprehend how well the suspect would have had to know those roads those unlit unmarked roads that you know who doesn't drive around in the middle of the night, early in the morning, and turn their cell phone off on deserted highways, please. Um, but to, to have that very, very logical, rational request just completely denied and to have the house demolished within a month, um, this all seems unfavorably stacked against the victims and their families. And I think that it's why it's so important, as you're doing, Nancy, to keep the pressure on everyone involved in this case, because the longer it is delayed, the worse it's going to be for the families. And just think, the summer's coming up, Maureen. What's the judge going to be mm -hmm. doing? Out golfing on the lake? He ought to have his rear end up on that bench trying this case <laughs> until it's mm -hmm. done. Enjoy your summer vacation, Judge, <laughs> while the families of these victims have more and more sleepless nights full of rage, full of anger, full of disillusionment with you and the justice system. You know what? I'm glad Lady Justice is wearing a blindfold because I would hate for her to see what this judge Nancy, is Nancy, can I ask you one question? This courtroom right now. Yes, hit me. I just want to know, with your own experience, you know, a case like this, for any judge, any lawyer, it's a potential star maker. So what's the thinking? He's Why older. He doesn't need it. Who gives a stylist? flying fig about being a star? I want justice. You think I ever thought I'd end up on TV when I tried a murder case? I'm not Never, talking about you at all. Ever. I'm not talking to you but here she is. Welcome, Nancy. This judge. Yeah. Okay. Number one, you're right. It could make and break the careers, make or break. Of the, the judges, prosecutors, all defense attorneys, all of them. And all this defense team oh. and this judge. Sorry, Nancy. In case they ever want to do anything beyond what more diff or we different. We do that on a shirt. Right I don't give a flying fig. 
they take it a little more seriously. I guess like they're making sure. Callahan, but apparently the judge doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. And that includes what the victim's families think about him. Okay. Uh, up until this point, yeah, I understood that he let's was not forget. judge. Now I'm starting to question that. What? Go jump in. Yeah, let's not forget, uh, Nancy, your vegan choices as well in the jail. Uh, you know, today, today we're serving uh, vegan meals uh, for Mr. Coburger, where everybody else is probably, you know, has two pieces of bread with a piece of bologna in between it. So, you know, this judge needs to just say, you know, let's get this thing moving. Let's move it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm a little more concerned about a true verdict for these families than I am about his bologna uh, sandwich. Agreed. But that said, we wait until justice unfolds. I can't wait to hear that alibi because I guarantee you there's going to be at least Look one at her. that's going to rip that She's like that giving us some hip into it. Shreds. I think you know who that is. <gasps> Goodbye, friend. Wow, Nancy. Wow. Mic drop. Man, I wish I had a mic. Man, that's what I need. Oh, I do have one and I dropped it once. It's big, but it's in the other room. <laughs> It's one of those like blue Yetis. First day I had it, I think, or second day I dropped it on the floor. Every YouTuber has that microphone. It's a terrible mic. I don't, I don't think it's very good, but it's not bad. I mean, it's not bad. It's not great. So this is what I was going to go back over in case you, um, in case you missed the beginning of the live, because Ann Taylor's been doing the most out there in the streets of Idaho. We went over a few different things that she's done. Um, but this one I'm going to say is probably the, um, the biggest one right now that we, I would say that I'm um, number, you know, 4,805 reasons why I don't like Ann Taylor. Just kidding. This, I, I didn't, I'm so, I don't like her now, especially after this. So she's, um, Ann Taylor is urging Idaho lawmakers not to pass a bill that would expand which defendants are eligible for capital punishment. The bill is seeking to make S crimes committed against children under the age of 12 punishable by death. She is saying that there's not enough room in their court system and their jail system for this because they take too long to process through. Takes too long. Um, they will be sitting in this, the court system, you know, in the jails for like, they'll be overcrowded. Um, you know, they don't have the, the manpower for it. I know, Ashley. I was trying to figure something out for you guys. Who wants I never cared for 18? I got no more figs to give for this guy. <laughs> I really want to show this is no more figs. I need to write that down because that's funny. That really is. I need to start writing these things down that she says or things that we say. And we're like, oh, that'd be funny on a shirt. No. <laughs> And it's not high, and this isn't high tea at Windsor Castle. Speaking of Windsor Castle, I mean, you know, the castle. Did everyone hear about Kate Middleton? Not to change the subject, but I just did kind of. I feel really bad for her. A lot of people were speculating on her, and I didn't like that. They were saying that her and uh, Prince William were going to get a divorce. And I was like, I don't see that. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, yeah, that's what that's how Nancy says that Melissa. She calls it Windsor Castle or something like that. Maybe she's Tessa Palace. Yeah, she has cancer. So a lot of people were like, Yeah, her and William are gonna get divorced, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking in my head, I'm like, I don't think so. Like, I don't to me, unlike his father, um, he doesn't seem like the type that would divorce his wife. I mean, neither did, you know, um Charles, but I think that he she wanted a divorce. I think Princess Diana wanted one, my personal humble opinion. But um, I couldn't believe that when they said she had cancer because I knew that something was up when there was like, there's no pictures of her, blah, blah, blah. She hasn't been out since like Christmas. And I'm like, that's a lot. I mean, that's, you know, we haven't seen her for a while. I was like, it must be something big. And then she had that surgery, they said, that was like, you know, she just happened to have it. She was out for six or eight weeks because of that or months. She, maybe it was like three months or something she was out. Yeah, I don't think he'll ever, he will. I don't think he'll divorce her either. But yeah. I just hope that she, nothing happens to her. I don't even know what kind of cancer it is. I need to look more into it. I really hope. I really, really hope. We only need one more like to get 100. Whoever isn't out there liking it, like it. I don't know, Lenora. That's a good question. Let me see if I can look it up. I don't know if they put that out there yet. Um, what? 
And if anyone knows, let us know. I'll probably, okay, let me see. This is probably. Did not reveal. Oncologists say the disease is often identified during other procedures. Hold on. So we don't know what kind of cancer it is. Huh. I was trying to see if there was anything I could look up more about it. Like how the princess is one of the growing number of young people getting cancer. How old is she? She's in her, what, 40s? I guess they don't, they're not saying. I know that I did hear that the, um, that Prince Charles' brother and uh, Meghan Markle, they came out and they released a statement just saying that they wished her good health. I don't, I don't know. It just didn't, when I saw it, I was like, that just doesn't sound very like genuine. <laughs> The way I read it, it was just like a, it was like a clip. It was like, they said there were like, well wishes pretty much get well. I'm like, Oh, no love lost there or something. Well, an oncologist, they are the people that diagnose, um, cancer. She's 42. That's what I thought. I thought she was like forties. Then after I said that, I was like, maybe she's younger, but 42, I guess that's pretty young. But I mean, I think that you can, you can get cancer at any age. I mean, kids have it. Teens have it. Preteens, I mean, anybody, no one's immune. That's one thing that nobody's immune to. Oh, court, that little court hearing was going to start. Um, I was going to see if there was anything else I wanted to show you guys before I got off here. I'm going to look up some videos about Nancy. I just want to get one that's not CNN because I'm afraid that if I play CNN, that like, they'll get me. And it was just a small clip, but we're going to find one of Nancy in action. I want to see her when she was in the courtroom. Also, I told you guys in the, the middle of the live um, if you're following the Ruby Frankie, J Jody Hildebrandt, Kevin Frankie case, um, they've all come out and they've released interviews. There have been photos of the kids, released videos of the kids and what they look like, the conditions they were in, the the handcuffs, that the stuff that was used on them is it's all there's body cam footage, all of it's out there. Um, jailhouse calls are being released. I'm doing a FOIA because I want all of it. I want all the jailhouse calls. I don't want court TV picking and choosing what we can watch. But before I get the FOIA request done on Monday, we'll, we're going to all hang out tomorrow and we're going to all watch it. Don't watch it alone. It's graphic. It, and I, you know, I, I don't usually do trigger warnings. I've never done a trigger warning. Really. I've said before, like trigger warning, you know me, but I've never actually stopped the chat and been like, you know, when we read the PCA, that's like your first day on the recess. You know what I mean? You're, just, you're on recess, hanging out, chilling, no care in the world. When we were reading that, we it was like nothing compared to what, what we, we hear and we see now. So Ashley went and watched. She was watching the 2020 special and she came in the chat. She said, I shouldn't saw that. And I was like, oh yeah, it's bad. It's really bad. So tomorrow is Saturday. I keep thinking today's Saturday. So probably about 9.15, I'd say, Lenora. Um, maybe a little bit earlier because there's a lot. There's a lot, but maybe we'll do 915. We'll just do like an hour, hour and so. Um, and if, I mean, it's out there. If you watch it, just, I'm just letting you know, just like, you know, after you're done, take a gummy, go take a bath, make sure someone's with you. It's just, it is bad. So tomorrow, um, so tomorrow we're going to cover Ruby Frankie's um, case, which she's, so they've released like videos, photos of the kids. I didn't think they were going to do that. So I didn't, if I knew that they were going to release all this stuff, I would have been FOIA. I would have FOIA this a while ago because this is like crazy. Um, but no, they literally are releasing like everything you can. See. So Eve, this is just to put this in perspective for you guys. They found Eve, Russell's little sister, nine years old in a bedroom, nothing in there, just her. The officers go to walk in and she's scared. They can't go in. He says, Hey buddy. Hey little buddy. I think at that point he didn't know if it was a girl, but I think that head was maybe down. And um, he says, I'm here to help you on policemen. 
even doesn't bite for like hours, multiple, multiple hours. It took them to coax this little girl and convince that this little girl that they were the good guys that they were the good, that they were really police officers. She was like not having it. Thank God for Russell. She was already going. She was already gone. Like she was already probably going towards the light. Thank God for little Russell. And they play when he got to the neighbor's house. Y'all. He says to the neighbor, he's so educated. He says, can I ask you for two things? And the neighbor says, what is it, son? And he says, will you call the local sheriff or the local police department for me? And he goes, I guess I just need the one favor. I mean, I was, mm. we read that he wanted water and food. We didn't hear nothing about that. Take me to the, you know, the, the police station stuff. So, and then we got, we got Jody on getting arrested and um, Ruby getting arrested. I'm telling y'all, it's going to be a good live tomorrow. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit the um, uh, all notifications button because you know me, I'd be notifying y'all of all kinds of stuff. Thank you, Mary Beth, for gifting a membership and baby girl got it. Yes, the math. It was so sad. I was watching it with Vincent and I was like, oh, I was like, did you see his legs? Mm, they're small guys. I mean, they're just, Vincent was like, how old is that kid? I said 12. And he was like, what? He said he looked like, um, I forget what he said now. I forget what he said. I'll have to ask him, but it, he called it a word. It's a word we all use. I, I mean, like we've used it before. I can't think of it, but it was like skin and bones, skeleton, pretty much like he looks like skeleton. Um, yeah. So we'll go over all of that tomorrow. That way, if you guys don't want to watch it alone, you don't have to, you can watch it with me and Nancy. She won't be there. She'll be over there like staring at me, but thank you guys all for coming tonight. I appreciate you guys so much for being here. Thanks for gifting memberships, Mary Beth. I appreciate that. New member. Yes. We love new members. Oh, speaking of members, we were supposed to do a members only live today because we haven't done one in a while. And then everything happened, you know, with Riley Strand came out. So we are going to do a live uh, members only live this weekend sometime. We'll make sure that we get it in and next week as well. So one day during the week next week, we're going to do like a larger one over the weekend. We'll do like an hour. We'll do like a shorter one. But um, if you guys don't mind, just hitting that like button all the way out. All that good stuff. Say goodbye to your friends. Say goodbye to me. Much love. Hearts and kisses. You know, X's and O's I give. That's what I give you guys. But thank you guys. Have a good evening. And I will see you guys all tomorrow. And if I don't, have a great weekend. Bye, guys.